This is a presentation which is scheduled to be uh, held at the NERA conference in Oslo um, in March uh, 2023. And the title of this presentation is called A MOOC About MOOC Making. And I make this video um, as an exercise in order to reflect upon um, and prepare myself in order to uh, do a public talk about um, making online courses. So this is the presentation and um, uh, more or less there is not going to be like many changes uh, if you were at uh, the conference uh, and listening to this presentation. Just a couple of words about myself. Um, uh, I have uh, I started as um, as uh, as a researcher many 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 years ago, uh, but uh, over the recent years I have become uh, more uh, wary of um, saying or labeling labeling myself as a MOOC entrepreneur. And I, um, although I'm an associate professor in, um, in digitalization uh, at the um, uh, Department of Pedagogy and ICT and Learning, um, I, and I work also at Oswald University College at the, um, the Faculty of um, Teacher Education and Languages. Uh, I have a sort of weird background uh, because initially I started as a social anthropologist and I conducted fieldwork among football supporters way back in 2002 in Barcelona. And um, uh, after that, uh, uh, the idea was actually to research uh, refugee issues, but I abandoned that um, field and crossed over to educational research when I started to work for a research institute called Sintef, which is located in Trondheim. Um, and there I did a lot of contracted uh, research for the Minister of Education or the Norwegian Minister of Education, which basically consisted of uh, collecting data and writing reports. And I would say that the output from that work was to assess the effects or to give a sort of assessment on what is going on within the Norwegian educational system and, and is educational policies working or not. But I got in contact with, uh, I started to, to, to work with many sociologists and um, thereafter I went over to work for NCU uh, and that, uh, and I went, uh, I climbed the sociology ladder uh, from 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 being a PhD candidate to become an associate professor, and that's where the journey on on making online courses started. And I was introduced to that concept back in 2012, um, and uh, I had no idea what that was. Uh, but after that, I have made roughly 15 online courses. Um, and uh, I say this because there is no job description for what I do. So my job consists of uh, innovating education uh, and I innovate education in the digital realm, so to speak, which means um, uh, researching um, or trying to assess what is online pedagogy, what are the effects of digitalization education, what are the effects uh, on society, and yeah, many of these different topics and uh, artificial intelligence and all that kind of stuff. But um, 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 so 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 the, uh, so I was first introduced to MOOC back, back in 2012. Uh, and uh, the structure of the uh, the structure and the content of this presentation is. First, I'm going to address what is this MOOC, and then I'm going to talk about the um, emerging research on MOOC uh, in uh, Scandinavian, or more, more specifically, uh, how it applies to a Norwegian context. And then I'm going to talk about the project itself, which is called MOOC, about MOOC making. And then there are going to be some questions, but in this video presentation, uh, I do not have any uh, session or time slot for asking questions from the audience. Uh, but anyway, uh, so what is MOOC? Uh, MOOC is uh, a sort of ambiguous term, but is mostly been coined by the Canadian 
um, researcher uh, George Simmons. And basically what he did uh, back in 2007, actually, or I think it was back in 2006, I'm not quite sure, but he made the learning content of his or university's courses available to anybody. And what I didn't expect is that uh, in their university course, they had thousands of uh, students who enrolled. And that was the start for the MOOC movement. Uh, so uh, George Simmons, uh, as a pioneer, I would say, in, uh, started a, uh, a wave which... Uh, initiated many many different concepts and on this slide you can see some of them uh, obviously MOOC is about massive uh, so it's about scalable and open online courses but there are many more different there are many additional concepts which are introduced for example badges is it's uh, online courses are so supposed to be self-paced um, um, the, the content, uh, new forms of assessment, there are many different educational formats, formats uh, which differs from X to CMOOCs. Now you have spooks and yeah, uh, many different. Uh, so my point is many different new words. And of course, uh, uh, when you never heard about it, then the question is, what is it? And, uh, and it starts the sense making, but it starts also a uh, production and, uh, uh, and in, in you also initiate new structures, a new way to think about pedagogy and online pedagogy. And I have been part of that movement. So um, if you sort of fast forward to uh, 2021, the numbers should have been actually for 2022, but Class Central is a is a website um, um, run by a um, former MOOC student, um, a, a former MOOC student, uh, who is uh, mapping and charting absolutely everything about MOOCs. Uh, and every year he publish um, a, um, uh, um, a report which is called MOOC by the Numbers. And you can basically see here that for 2021, uh, on the five largest MOOC platforms, which are Coursera, edX, FutureLearn, um, and some others, uh, there are about 220 million uh, users or students. And there are many, uh, and there are also almost a thousand students, no, a thousand uh, universities who provide online contents. So there are quite staggering numbers in the sense that there is a an ongoing production of um, online courses. And the first wave, I would call it, which was sort of experimentation, uh, is sort of past. Now you have, it's become more standardized, I would say. Now you can uh, debundle and rebundle online courses and you can offer what is called micro-credentials. And, um, and uh, we can only assume that these numbers for 2022 are much more higher. So there is a uh, so so uh, uh, so there is uh, so so basically what you can see what happened to Facebook when it started, where it was uh, just an infrastructure and many users and content come together. There's a lot of network effects and there creates an online community and there this have tremendous impact on how we run our lives and it also impacts organization and society at large. So basically what are we seeing here? What is the sort of pattern? I would call it, a, I believe that we uh, live in a, in a so-called platform society, let's say uh, concept which was introduced a couple of years ago um, and um, and uh, the effect of it is that we see a platformization of education and basically what you see this is just like a very simplified model that I created is that the platformization is consists of that you have a MOOC platform which could uh, which is just empty and the universities are providing content in the sense of uh, they publish online courses and it's ready-made and then you have all these users uh, who come from all across the globe and suddenly you have um, what I would call um, 
uh, network effects. Uh, so in practical terms, if you just have an online course there, you can have thousands of lear uh, learners in your online courses. And I have done that a couple of times. Uh, so I have two MOOCs on or two online courses on Future Learn. So um, so um, passing on to to so so this global trend, I would call it, uh, obviously have influenced the Scandinavian countries, and there is an emerging research on it. Um, uh, so I have been like one of these uh, uh, content providers to, to this research uh, stream, I would say. But we have other researchers who are trying to assess or establish a more sort of holistic picture of what is this research. And uh, Katrina Tomte, she wrote a very, um, an, um, with her colleagues, uh, wrote a very nice article where she tries to summarize and uh, point, ask the question if there is a particular sort of Scandinavian model for MOOCs and to what extent uh, the approaches are similar or differ within Norway, Denmark and Sweden. And, and particularly when she, she describes the Norwegian context, it's... Um, um, there is a process which is called localization, and uh, it sort of consists of that on, on a sort of on a, on a state level, on a national level, uh, you have policy makers who are under trying to acquire competencies on what MOOC is, uh, in order to uh, have a competency or an apparatus to give pro uh, economical funding to the universities so they can make online courses. I'm, I'm experienced, so it's sort of weird. Um, and um, so you can basically say that there are like two different, um, the research uh, uh, that um, Katrina Tomte and her colleagues have uh, charted uh, sort of states that, um, that the particular way that Norwegian universities uh, adapt MOOC is that they take the concept and they retranslate it and adapt it into the local context. There's, there is a translation there. So you get like many different ways of organizing MOOCs. So it means in practical terms that that uh, you have at least two effects when it comes to how the research describes um, uh, MOOC in a Norwegian context, and that is on the one hand side, you have those who make online courses and they study and they try to ascertain the effects of it. That's more sort of pedagogy. And but you have another research which tries to address the organizational implications of MOOCs. And I have addressed both uh, these uh, ideas. And but uh, what is not uh, picked up in this research is that uh, the question is, are universities prepped for having adequate support structures for uh, making online courses or make uh, or online pedagogy in general? And in an article that we public, I published with um, a couple of my um, a couple of my colleagues from uh, NTU, um, from NTU, Inga Langset and Don Ingeve, we uh, we uh, we uh, sort of found that uh, these MOOC entrepreneurs. Um, struggle a lot and uh, the and they are the sort of the, the makers of these new support structures and what we find is that uh, they are located in these pockets of innovation at various different universities so it's, you can imagine that it's like a social field to a certain extent and in these uh, pockets of innovation they start to uh, construct practices which are related to these over idea, overall ideas of what MOOC is. So it means that you start with, you have an open platform, you uh, start uh, to, um, to work with instructional design, uh, you start to, uh, to have uh, target groups, uh, you start to uh, uh, think differently about uh, how to um, uh, how to create the courses. Uh, there are many different ways that you can do it, and so on. And this is not a very sort of controlled movement, because uh, a controlled field, I would say, because depending on the resources that you the, each university has, will actually m um, it will be 
they will be mirrored differently. So you can say that at a big university, they will have much more resources in order to create these support units. But if you go to a very small university, university college, the support structures are non-existent. So uh, how much power they, or how much power, or how much resources the different university have reflects on how well. So there is, so it differs a lot. But there is develop, um, but we call these pockets of innovation where MOOC production uh, occurs. So, but there is a problem. Uh, so the challenge for a MOOC entrepreneur is that we don't have like any national infrastructure for where we can deploy our online courses. If you are a student, it is very difficult to find them. Um, uh, there is no national infrastructure where we can deposit uh, all the uh, online con online resources that we can. Videos, for example, we use YouTube. Um, we most people, most educators today, uh, when it comes to using an online platform, is familiar with Canvas, <coughs> and we have limited uh, access to the data because of data protection uh, issues. And if we see that there there are online courses, there is a tendency that campus pedagogy uh, is being extended into the online world, and my, and that also happens to micro credentials basically. So. Uh, so we are not um, uh, on a sort of desired level, I would say. So the project, and that is the reason why we created this project, MOOC about MOOC making. So it's basically a project which teaches you the MOOC pedagogy or the online pedagogy, and uh, and in the course you create an online lesson or a online course which is you define yourself. And we have never done this before. So we, apl we applied the Norwegian Director for Higher Education and Skills. And, uh, and uh, that was, so uh, the, the, the project lasted from 20 to 22, so it was a two year. Uh, and we had three different target groups. We wanted to innovate. So we had teachers in high school, which education and higher education, and people who work with, uh, uh, with training in work life. So the basic idea is that first the student learn the MOOC pedagogy and then applies it to make an online course themselves. And you have that so divided over two different. So I'm just going to uh, and, uh, address the online design. I have done a lot of data collection on this issue, but that is... <laughs> It is a lot of data to 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 uh, interpret and analyze. So uh, so I'm just using this as an occasion to to explain the learning design, and then I'll take question afterwards. Uh, but I just want to credit uh, the people who has been involved uh, because uh, at least I've been with the pro uh, it has been at least like uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, yeah. Roughly 15 people who have been involved. So it is, so if you enter into the online realm and if you want to make an online course, it demands a lot of manpower in that sense. So uh, these people, uh, these uh, faculties or these people uh, have contributed in various ways. It's either creating the online course, running it, or they have been part of the support structure or they have assessed the the uh, the uh, uh, online courses that was produced by our students so i just want to sort of uh, make their names known to the audience so what is the student to learn um this is it um, um this is coursera and uh here you have many online courses which are stacked uh, and available and you can just browse through it you just dial in the um, the um, you just put in the 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 uh, the your keyword uh, and what you want to learn and then you have this sort of one fit um, one size fit all uh, platform uh, where basically it is uh, um, a shell which you w which you have to provide with content, and this sort of visualize what uh, the pedagogy is about. You have to learn to uh, uh, structure the content. Uh, it has to be um, f um, 
uh, it has to be be you can use many different modalities for either text video or sound uh, the uh, it's all about structuring the uh, online contact is uh, structuring the 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 order of uh, of uh, of um, the online contacts and how it's divided against uh, learning activities and assessment font so and obviously uh, what many struggle with is to make uh, online videos which um, uh, which is like a new skill set so you become this content producer of your uh, own uh, courses and do you have like uh, and this is Andrew Nung and he's the founder of Coursera um, and and you basically this is the online experience you're supposed to make oops so uh, how was the f first online course uh, which is like the sort of theory uh, section or sec part of the uh, pro of the MOOC making process organized uh, we had about seven modules and there was a lot of uh, thinking going to how we're going to organize this and it was asynchronous um, so we've had first a uh, a module about which prepped which addressed the transition from your way of uh, teaching and saying that there is actually a great distinction between teaching in a campus setting or being in, an, in a classroom and making a transition and the m most important transition is that you stop your lecture and you give more formative assessment um, and you also become a content producer. Uh, so the other uh, issue is that you need to learn how to design online courses. And then we had these other core elements, which goes on uh, digital test and ass uh, assessment uh, for online learning. And then we have modules which addressed uh, which which is which are the the most um, time-consuming activities and that is the, the content production and you also learn about uh, teaching strategies and we had uh, a module on learning theories and the new learning theories for the digital age and so so there was like some uh, uh present in our online course and we and here it was um, an examined folder I'm not sure how we translate that into, into English but well, there's a lot of practical assignments so it was not where you write an essay you do a lot of practical assignments which how do you set up a quiz how do you make a video how do you write like a short text how do you design your uh, online course uh, uh, your thoughts about uh, teaching in the online world and so on so it lasts about for 12 uh, weeks and 100 students, 110 students was enrolled. And additionally, uh, when the students started, they got like a sandbox, a, ca a canvas uh, um, uh, room where they could actually experiment and make the online course. Um, uh, that's where they actually uh, submitted their assignments. And they also, that's where actually they made their online courses. But they, they also had the possibility to to um, use other platforms so uh, and how does it look this is how it is um, uh, this is the landing site uh, the the first site it's in Norwegian um, it, it's um, here we see the structure of the 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 um, so you, as you see the structure and the learning path itself it you so you basically have to work with the uh, titles you have to uh, structure the uh, the uh, module in a sense that there is like a narrative that you can um, read from uh, the numbering uh, and from the titles of what the content is and you also have to address that um, um, uh, uh, the, 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 that there are like different learning opportunities so it cannot become like this sort of textbook uh, online course and uh, if we just fast forward uh, and you also have to become um, uh, more wary of how you actually set up on your online course the design which goes into it and not say that on a web page which have learning contents that it's no more than you're not supposed to student the students not supposed to spend more than 10 to 15 minutes and how do you present present that so 
many many different uh, uh, design challenges uh, and here we have um, discussions and this is like an example of of how uh, um, let me see here uh, this is an example of how you structure the the online content that some content uh, need to be I mean like core uh, core um, terms uh, or definitions have to be highlighted in such a certain extent and you have to use the tools which are available and embedded in the platform that we use so that was that and in the on uh, in the second uh, here the idea is that it's more or less similar to how you would supervise students who are doing a who are writing a bachelor uh, assignment or master so uh, in this uh, so here the the, the student uh, the, the student follows this sort of pipeline um, or this process I would say where they start to define their own idea and they uh, continue to a module where they actually um, uh, start with the course design and when they have the course design they start with the production of the online course and they and they they uh, and, th and uh, how we sort of organize it is that we have about 50 60 students um, we were three um, teachers uh, three uh, faculties and so we would have like 14 or 15 students each that we followed through the entire process and we f uh, gave feedback on how to to uh, to uh, uh, to develop and I've never done that before so that was a completely different way uh, how in comparison to how we did in the, in the first uh, online course where each um, faculty had a, uh, a specific had um, had assigned modules and they just gave feedback here we each followed so like two different approaches um, so and it is not much more different um, um, same my basic idea uh, that you have a um you see, there is a module um a setup that we have to use and we have to define this um same idea uh, which uh, you need titles to be clear there has to be a numbering the uh, uh numbering uh, the numbering indicate what kind of learning activity either if it's learning contents or if it's learning activity or if there's an assessment form or if there is a quiz or if there is like a discussion forum um so and that is it so some experiences so we had like 134 enrolled students they say it's like very time consuming um yeah and we had 134 enrolled and roughly about 55 completed both online courses it was time consuming and uh too much learning contents um and the students report that they learn so they acquire new skills